This is continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. In the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell from the Hidden Killers podcast. Hidden Killers podcast. That it is. We're up to segment number two in the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell. Let's go to the courtroom. Okay, we're back on the record on CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Mr. Thomas is conducting cross-examination of the witness, Mr. Balance. You can continue with your cross if you'd like at this time, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Balance, or uh, Special Agent Balance, would you, we were just about to talk a little bit about drive testing. Uh, can you tell me uh, what type of equipment is involved in that? Yeah, so what we're using is what's called a GAR, which is a Gladiator Autonomous Receiver. And basically what that equipment does is it collects the different RF frequencies that are being broadcast by the different cellular providers in a specific area. So in order to take measurements, you would need to drive or move that gear around. Typically, we'll do it with a car. And as we drive, it's constantly taking measurements of the different radio frequency that it's detecting with those sensors that it's utilizing. Once we get all of those particular measurements, that's whenever we would take it back into a software mapping program and would look at, and we can basically filter out specific towers and sectors and what that true coverage would look like for each individual one that it detected. And, and, and you said you did this particular test in June of 2020? Yes, sir. That's correct. And how long does that test take? So it depends on the area that we're specifically driving. So if we're just doing one tower on sector, you could feasibly do that in a day. Again, it depends on... If you're looking at just a tower and sector that's in downtown Boise, the coverage area probably is not going to go out nearly as far as in a rural area. So we're driving basically to the next tower and a little bit beyond to see how far that coverage goes. When you're talking about a rural area or you're talking about doing an entire city like Rexburg, it took us um, driving better part of a week to complete it. And that was Rexburg, Sugar City, uh, uh, St. Anthony, the whole area that's in your cast report? Correct. That only took you a week to do? Correct. All right. Um, and this Gladiator Autonomous Receiver, is this a piece of equipment that is a government issue, or is this something that is uh, in the industry? So it's in the industry. The company that produces is Gladiator. Okay. Uh I believe you indicated on direct examination uh, that you cannot, you, you, there's no way you could ever uh, be able to tell where a phone was located 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Correct. What I mean by that is that it depends on, we have to have a record in um, from one of the carriers for a specific date and time. So if we don't have a record for a specific date and time, then we're not able to um, estimate a location at that particular date and time. And then on top of that as well, it's dependent on the records. So if we're looking at a tower and sector that provides coverage to a large area, then the area we estimate that that phone is is going to be much larger than certain types of records that we receive, like from the Google location that have a much smaller margin of error. And in this particular case, the sectors are vast, right? I mean, they're huge. There's several towers in this case that have coverage areas that are large, yes. Okay. And so when you're saying that a particular phone is within a particular sector, I mean, that could be 40, 50 square miles, right? It depends on the tower and sector, but it could be a large area. Okay. Let's talk about in this case. How large are these areas? So without having measurements on the map to determine the square area, I mean, I think what you're getting at is that there's a large area. So if you look at particularly that tower that is in St. Anthony, It has coverage that goes down almost into Rexburg. So depending, again, without having, you know, a ruler and being able to map out that exact area, I'll definitely say it's a large area. Okay, so if I was to tell you between St. Anthony and Rexburg, it's about 12 to 15 miles in one direction, just going down the highway. Okay. And would that make sense to say, well, it's probably 12 miles one direction, and then there's also another slice of the pie, which covers... Maybe what, uh, another 12, 15, 20 miles square? I mean, again, without looking at it on a map, I don't want to abstractly say what the square mileage would be. Okay. Uh, 
And so when you're, you know, when the prosecutor was examining you and you were, we had all these charts and very great charts if you know what you're doing and if you know what you're looking at. But for the layperson like me or something, it's a little bit difficult. And so what I want to know is, is there any way to say that based on those charts, based on your readings of those charts and based on your readings of those of all that data, that there's any way you can pinpoint to say that anybody was on the Chad Daybell area or in the Chad Daybell complex or homestead without looking at the GPS? So if we're excluding completely the Google location history and we're only looking at the phones, the best way you would be able to tell whether or not a device was near the Chad Daybell residence is whenever you have two different towers and sectors being utilized in close proximity and time and they have overlapping coverage. It still would not, in my opinion, be able to tell you that it was at the Chad Daybell residence. It would only be able to, you would only be able to say that it's consistent with it being at the Chad Daybell residence. But it also could be in any of those overlapping areas that appear on the map. So would that be considered triangulation or when you're using cell towers to triangulate to try to find where a person is or where a person, where a person's phone would be? Somewhat. Usually triangulation is based off of the measurement from particular towers. And then whenever you have multiple, the more that you have, the more you can overlap those measurements away from a particular tower. When we're talking about the drive test, what we're looking at is the true coverage area of a tower and sector compared with the true coverage area of a second tower and sector. And what that gives us is that overlap, which can be of as you can see from some of the maps, that shape is not exactly circular or representative of, you know, defining lines. It can look more like a cloud than anything else. Okay. But based on the evidence that you've seen, based on the data that you've crunched, uh, you couldn't place anybody at the Daybell residence based on the cell data alone. There was no, there was no triangulation. You didn't use two towers in any of these, any of the charts that I saw. Is that right? So I did use multiple towers in some of them. And what I would say is that I wouldn't be able to definitively say that that phone was only at the Daybell residence. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about September 23rd. Uh, I believe you indicated uh, that Chad Daybell's phone and Alex Cox's phone were both at the same area of Chad Daybell's home. Is that right? So when we're looking at just the phone separate from the Google location history, what you could see is that Alex Cox's phone, the number ending 9120, was utilizing a Verizon tower. And then the number, and I'm going to mess up the last four, but the, starting with 515 for Chad Daybell's number, that's utilizing the AT&T network. So it's utilizing two different networks. And then looking at the coverage area of the towers being utilized, by the Daybell phone utilizing the AT&T network versus the Verizon phone utilizing the Verizon network. But you couldn't put them on the same property at the same time based on that data? I can't put them in the exact same location. I can only put them within the coverage area of those towers and sectors. Okay. And, again, those coverage areas are miles and miles apart, right? Yes, correct. Okay. All right. And how long uh, were Alex Cox and... Chad Daybell within the coverage area together on September 23rd? I would have to look back at the slides to see the exact times, but again, it's dependent on whenever we see those records. So as an example, if you're looking at a time of 921, and there's a record at 921, then there's also a record at, say, 942. I can't say between that time any estimated location of where a phone is. I can only estimate the location at those given times in the records. Can you explain to the jury again, because I was a little confused about this as well, explain to the jury again why you can sometimes read text messages that were given uh, as you did in, in your cast report, and sometimes you, you just say that there's an SMS message or that there's a text message. Absolutely. So there's two ways that you can get to the con- – well, two general ways that you can get to the content of a text message. You could do it either by – looking at the phone, and basically what we would do in law enforcement would be a forensic download of that phone to pull all the data off of there. So it's dependent on an examiner of what files are there, if something's deleted, whether it's recoverable. 
that's separate from what I'm doing. Typically what I'm doing is I'm looking at interactions between a particular carrier and a phone, not per se what's in the phone itself. So whenever I'm doing that, it's dependent on what records are maintained by each individual carrier. So at the time, whenever this investigation was going on and the dates that I was looking for, Verizon was the only carrier that maintains content of text messages for a window of anywhere between three and seven days. It just depends on their specific, um, how many text messages go across a specific account. So after that, they don't retain them. The other carriers don't retain text messages. So the only way that I would be able to review the content of text messages would be if there was a forensic download of the phone and those messages were recoverable or we obtained records from a Verizon phone within that short window of time. And I believe, I believe you indicated you did find some content on Chad Daybell's phone, is that right? Yes, that was on one of the Verizon phones. And you got that content within three to seven days of uh, of it being made, of the text so being made? That search warrant would have been not been done by me. Um, typically, an investigator will serve a search warrant, obtain data from a cell phone provider, and then send that message, send that data to us to conduct analysis on. So I couldn't speak to when that search warrant was done. Okay. So you indicated a lot of uh, GPS location on Alex Cox. You didn't have any GPS locations on Lori Vallow or Chad Daybell. Is that right? I did not, no. Okay. You didn't use that in any of your analysis? I didn't have it to use. Okay. Uh, were you aware of how long Lori and Alex had lived in this particular area of Rexford? Roughly, um, I know they were somewhat new to the area, but as far as dates, no, I'm not aware. If I were to tell you that they had moved there September the 1st of that same year, it's 2019, uh, and these all these records look like they're from uh, September the 1st through October, November, December of 2019, does that make sense? So I know I had records prior to September the 1st, but I don't recall mapping those out to see like when those devices first started showing up in Rexburg. Okay. So given the fact that they had moved there, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, just assuming that they had moved there on September the 1st, there's no way that you could make any type of assumptions uh, based on patterns of, of behavior um, for where these people were going or what they were doing, right? Suggestion, speculation? Overruled. I mean, what I was going to say is that typically when I speak on other cases, the more data we have, so for instance, if I'm looking for an individual that's wanted by law enforcement, typically what I would do is I would look at 30 days historically to try and get a pattern of what that phone's doing during those 30 days. And so, I mean, I would agree to you from this, from the standpoint of the more records I have to establish what's called a pattern of life would be better. Okay. But you've indicated that in other uh, cases you have established a pattern of life based on a 30-day time frame period? A version of pattern of life. Again, it's dependent on the records because I think, like, Everybody in this courtroom has, you know, a routine or something that they typically do. And if we were to examine records for the past 30 days versus for the past year, you would either see major changes or you might see the same thing. It just depends on everybody's particular situation. Okay. Um, on October the 19th, the date that uh, Tammy Daybell passed away, or the 18th, um, you you believe that Lori's phone was in Hawaii, is that right? So from the record that I showed um, at that particular time, that device was in Hawaii. And then I would add to that, too, that, you know, it's not right around the corner. So it would take, you know, travel to get to Hawaii. Right. All right. Thank you. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any redirect from the state?
Just one moment, Your Honor. Uh, Defense counsel asked you about GPS location data for Lori Daybell and Chad. Lori Vallow or Lori Daybell and Chad Daybell, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, is it possible to turn the GPS geolocation data off on your phone? It is. So as I mentioned before, um, especially with Google, that location services is based off of whether a user wants to opt in or out. And so as part of their privacy protections, you can opt out of your location being maintained by Google. That's all I have. Very well. That will conclude the testimony of this witness then. Uh, is this witness going to be recalled or can he be excused from any subpoena? Your Honor, at this time we wouldn't excuse him from a subpoena. Just, not. Uh, no, thank you. All right. Uh, Agent Balance, then you are still under subpoena, uh, subject to the direction of the state. If you, uh, if there's a potential you'll be recalled, I'll instruct you that I'll ask you again whether or not you've viewed any of the trial testimony. So if you're intending to testify again, you're not allowed to view that based on the exclusionary rule that's been ordered in this case. So with that in mind, then, um, you can go ahead and be excused. The bailiff will help assist you out of court, and the state could call its next witness. Your Honor, Spencer Ramel for the state. Can we have a quick sidebar before we call this next witness, please? Yes. Thank you. All right, Mr. Rammel, then you can call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state would call Summer Shiflett. Before we get started, then, I'll note that uh, the court has previously designated this particular witness as a representative under Idaho's victims' laws, so the exclusionary rule would not apply um, as to this witness, whether or not she's watched any trial testimony. So I'll just advise you, then, Ms. Shiflett, when you're being questioned, please use verbal responses so we get your answers on the record. Please avoid talking at the same time as anyone asking you a question, wait for their question to be complete. That way we'll also keep the record clear, and with those ground rules in mind, then, Mr. Rammel, you can go ahead and inquire on your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Schiffler. Good morning. Can I please have you state your full name and spell your last name for the record? Summer Schifflet, S-H-I-F-L-E-T. Ms. Schifflet, how do you know the defendant in this case? She's Lori, my sister. I'm sorry, Lori Vallow Daybell. You're fine. She's my sister. And is she your older sister? Yes. And this is obvious without asking, Ms. Shiflet, but can I have you clarify for the record how that makes you related to JJ Vallow and Tylee Ryan? Tylee and JJ were my niece and nephew. And did you should, I'm sorry to interrupt too, Ms. Shiflet. If you don't mind, if you can kind of lean forward right to the microphone and talk into it, we'll make sure to pick up the recording. Okay. Thank you. And did you play an active role in your niece and nephew's life? Yes. When were you first made aware that your niece and nephew were missing? Um... I think through the media, but 
probably December of 2019. And at that time, December of 2019, were you in contact with your sister? No. Were you aware of where she was located at that time? No. Ms. Shiflett, have you had a close relationship with your sister? Yes. At some point, did you talk to your sister and ask her about JJ and Tylee's well-being? Yes. Um, I think our first contact was um, in February of 2019, after she had been arrested. And what did she tell you about JJ and Tylee? I don't remember the exact wording, but she basically told me that she was aware of where they were and that they were safe. Ms. Shiflett, fair to say that you trusted what she told you? Yes. You believed your sister when she stated to you that JJ and Tylee were safe? Yes. I'm going to draw your attention to early June of 2020, uh, when JJ and Tylee's bodies were found. You testified that you trusted your sister. After the discovery of JJ and Tylee, did that change? Yes. Why? I felt lied to and my trust in my sister was broken. Ms. Shiflett, a recording of a video visit between yourself and Ms. Valo Daybell has previously been admitted in this case. Do you recall the date of that specific video call? I believe it was on June 24th. I had received a request for me to call her. And just for clarification of the record, do you recall the year? 20, 2020. Your Honor, can I be handed what has previously been admitted as State's Exhibit 34A? Yes. And, Your Honor, having been previously admitted, I now ask to publish what has been previously admitted and marked as State's Exhibit 34A to the jury. All right, give me just a moment to confer with the clerks, please. Thank you. All right, permission to publish is granted, Mr. Rammel. Thank you, Judge.
to be thrown away like garbage in the ground. And that that's okay. There is nothing in the scriptures that is godly about hurting a child. Nothing. And they deserve a proper burial with family that loves them at the least. I can't support that.
Your Honor, that's all I have for this witness. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rammel. Exhibit 34A has been returned to the court clerk. Is there a cross-examination, Mr. Archibald? I'm sorry you had to relive that. So just some uh, foundation to give some background here. Uh, you're Lori's younger sister, you said? Yes. And you're one of how many children? I'm the youngest of five. And uh, who's who's the oldest child? Stacy, my oldest sister. And it, is she alive or is she deceased? She's deceased. And did she have any children before she died? Yes. And who would that be? My niece, Melanie. Okay. Is that who we've heard the name Melanie Pedro or Melanie Pulowski? Is that Stacy's child? Yes. Okay. And then who's next after Stacy? Alex. And then Alex Cox is who we've heard that name during this trial as well. How much older is he than you? I think eight years. Okay. And then who's next after Alex? Adam. And Adam Cox... Uh, it, it, where does he live now? St. George, Utah. Okay. And then, uh, and he was a friend of Charles Vallow? Yes. Okay. And then who's next after Adam? Well, my, pa my parents had a child that died. Um, her name was Laura Lee. We called her Lolly. But she died, she died before I was born. Okay. How old was she when she died? Six weeks. And then after her, who was next? Lori. And so Lori is how much older than you? Two years. And so you and Lori grew up together? Yes. And, and you grew up together where? In Rialto, California. And how old uh, were you when you moved away from California? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. How old were you, uh, or how long did you live in California? I think until I was about 18, 17 or 18. Okay. So you and Lori would have been adults by the time that you uh, moved away from California? Yes. So uh, would you describe, how would you describe your relationship with Lori growing up? I feel like we had a close relationship. We had a lot of similar interests and friends in common, and we did a lot of activities together. Okay. Uh, go, go to schools together? Yes. Uh, go to church together? Yes. Uh, how would you describe your family life? I think we had a good family. I mean, we had problems, but we also had a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, do you remember when Lori, f her first marriage? Yes. And uh, do you remember how old she was? It was right out of high school. So I think 18. So she was 18 and you were 16 when that happened? Yeah. And did that marriage last long? No. Uh, do you remember her second marriage? Yes. And who was that to? Uh, William LaJoya. And is that the father of Colby who we met here last week? Yes. Okay. And did that marriage last long? Longer than the first, but not that long. Okay. And then did Lori get married again? Yes. And who was her third husband? Joseph Ryan. And is Joseph Ryan the father of Tylee Ryan? Yes. And during this time uh, of these <coughs> these relationships that Lori was having, did you stay close with Lori? Off and on. When, when did you get married? In 2000. And so did you have your own uh, life that you were trying to live as well? Yes. And did you uh, try to maintain good contact with Lori? Yes, but we lived in two different states, so it was more challenging. Okay. Uh, 
And you have children of your own. Yes. And how many children do you have? Three. Okay. And uh, do you recall when Lori separated from Joe Ryan? Yes. And uh, and did Lori protect Colby and Tylee from Joe Ryan? Yes. All right. And so uh, when you talk on this uh, on this phone call with your sister Lori, um, that you would have never done anything to harm your children. Is that the way you felt? Yes. Okay. And that's because of seeing her raise Colby and Tylee and JJ. Yes. Did you also get to know uh, Charles Vallow? Yes. And uh, how did, if you can briefly tell us about the relationship between Charles and Lori? I think they had a great relationship in the beginning, and they seemed very compatible, and they seemed very happy. And they adopted JJ? Yes. And were you involved in your sister's life when that happened? Yes. Were you involved in your sister's life when Lori and Charles separated? Yes. Uh, were you aware that Charles had filed for divorce? I'm not sure if I knew that until it came out in the media, because I don't think she was ever served. Okay. And then they, so they, as far as you knew, they had reconciled? Yes. Okay. So uh, were you a part of Lori's life uh, when Charles and J.J. Uh, moved to Texas? Yes. Not as close, but yes. Okay. Were you a, a part of Lori's life when the whole family had moved to Hawaii? Yes. Okay. Now, was Hawaii a destination that, that your family had gone to as well when you were a child? Um, I had been there one time as a child, and then I didn't go back again until I was a married adult. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I did go back one time before I got married, so I had two trips before I got married. Okay. And so uh, was that a place that your father and mother had taken you uh, and the family? Yes. Uh, how uh, did you uh, see Tylee grow up? Yes. Uh, how would you describe Tylee? I would describe her as beautiful and witty and very talented in a lot of different ways. Uh, did she uh, have health issues in her life? Yes. Uh, do you remember what those were? She had pancreatitis several times. And, and do you know what that is? It's a swelling of your pancreas. It, was that something that required hospitalization? Yes. Okay. And were you able to see Tylee and Lori together? Yes. And can you describe that? I think Lori was a loving mother, and Tylee adored her mother. They had a. They fought sometimes. Tylee had a little sassy streak in her, but um, I always felt like Lori was very patient with her. Were you ever concerned about the safety of Tylee around Lori? No. Uh, would you ever imagine your sister? Uh, wanting to kill her kids? No. Would you ever imagine your sister being involved in conspiring to kill her kids? No. <laughs> now, uh, the way you were raised, were you raised in, in a way to believe in Jesus? Yes. And, and the Jesus that you were taught about, was that a, a Jesus who was kind and loving? Yes. And is that how you were taught? 
Yes. And is that how uh, Lori was taught? Yes. And is that how Lori taught her children? Yes. So, um, did you ever hear uh, your sister talk about multiple lives? She's, she, she and Alex had both mentioned that to me, I think, in late 2018. Okay. It's the first was that, time. Was that something new? Yes. Was that something that you had been taught as children? No. Uh, did you ask Lori where this new belief was coming from? I don't know if I asked her that directly. Uh, did she talk about multiple creations? Yes. Uh being reincarnated as different people over the eons of time. Is that what she was telling you? Not with the word reincarnated, but yes. Okay. So they weren't using the word reincarnated, but multiple probations, multiple creations. Correct. And is that something new that you had heard? It was new to me. Uh, Had you ever heard Lori be talk about being someone in another life prior to late 2018? No. At at this time in late 2018 or early 2019, did she tell you that she had been someone else in another life? Prior to 2018? Prior to 2018. No. In late 2018 or 2019, did she tell you that? Yes. Yes. Did she, did she tell you about her previous lives? Yes. Did any of that make sense to you? Not really. Uh, did you believe it? I tried to. I wanted to believe her, but it didn't make sense. Did she tell you in late 2018, 2019 about zombies? And Your Honor, at this point, I'm going to object to hearsay. Uh, Ms. Valaday Bell is not a party opponent as to the defense. The exception does not apply. Let me think about that for just a minute, Mr. Rammel. Can you further explain why you think the exception would not apply here and why this would be hearsay? Uh, Judge, I think the exception, uh, he's asking specifically for statements of uh, his client. Uh, She is a party opponent of the state. Uh, The party opponent... Uh, from the state's perspective, wouldn't apply uh, to Ms. Vallow, who is uh, the client of Mr. Uh, Archibald. All right, what's your response to that, Mr. Archibald? Your Honor, Your Honor this is just some foundation. I think the jury's already heard a bits and pieces of this. This is just to confirm that information. Uh, it's been admitted in the state's case in chief, and I do find that it's relevant and would not uh, be hearsay. So I'll overrule the objection and allow the witness to answer that last question, which was, uh, and I'll just cite, did she tell you in late 2018, 2019 about zombies was the question. So you can answer. I don't recall her ever telling me about zombies, that word. I don't remember her ever using that terminology. Okay. Uh, Did she talk to you about her ability to cast out evil spirits? I believe so. Uh, Did she tell you about light and dark scales? Yes. And is that something that you had heard before that time period? Never. Uh Oh. Did she tell you that she was a goddess? I don't recall if she used that terminology. Did she tell you that she was a leader of the 144,000? No. Did she tell you that there was a new church called the Church of the Firstborn? I don't recall her ever telling me that specifically. Yeah. Were you concerned about your, your sister? with her new beliefs. I don't know that I was concerned about 
safety of anybody. I just was concerned. I mean, I, of course, I care about my sister, but I didn't really know what to think about it. Okay. So I don't know if concerned is the right word. Okay, but fair enough. Uh, how was your relationship with with Alex? Um, I was close with Alex. Now, uh, can you tell the jury what he was like? Well, he was my big brother, and sometimes he was hilarious and fun, and sometimes he was um, kind of crude or obnoxious in a way. And But most of the time, we got along really well, and he was at my house most weekends playing games with my kids. And, and did he have children of his own? No. Uh, did he uh, s- suffer a brain injury as a teenager? Yes. And what, what, was that from a car accident? Yes. And did that uh, brain injury in that car accident, did that affect him? I believe it did. Uh, was he different uh, after that car accident than he was before? He seemed almost stuck in making, like, teenage decisions. He got in his car accident at 16, and he kind of made decisions like a 16-year-old most of his life. And so he was... Uh, it, that's what you observed, is that he was stuck as a teenager. In his decision-making, yes. Okay. Uh, are, do you stay in touch with Colby Ryan? Yes. And uh, Colby had previously stated my mom spent her whole life protecting us kids. Would, would you agree with that? Yes. Colby also stated after she met Chad Daybell, she changed. Would you agree with that? Yes. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. So to clarify there, counsel had requested of the court prior that the defense was going to call Ms. Shiflett as their own witness, so the court permitted uh, the defense to go beyond cross and have a direct examination essentially there. So with that then, Mr. Rammel, if you'd like to conduct cross and or redirect, you can do so. Thank you, Judge. Just very quickly. Ms. Shifflett, just a couple questions for you. I'm going to draw your attention back to the time period in which uh, you were made aware uh, that J.J. and Tylee were missing. You testified that your sister told you that she knew where Tylee was? I don't remember if she used that wording, but yes, that was what was relayed to me. Okay, and conveyed to you that she knew... Uh, where J.J. was? Yes. She told you uh, that they were safe? Yes. Ms. Shifflett, she lied to you about them being safe? I believe so, yes. Judge, that's all I have. All right. That will conclude, then, the testimony of Ms. Shifflett. That wraps up segment number two of our continuous coverage in the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell. There's much more to come. Press subscribe so you don't miss a moment of it. This is continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. In the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell from the Hidden Killers Podcast. Hidden Killers Podcast.